You are doing something so unique that the world has to hear. You're bringing a new equation that really works. Finding the best combo using traditional approaches, it's a needle in 10 galaxies. It's not possible. We've proven it's not expensive. This is not a technology for only the wealthy. We want to provide this for everybody. Good afternoon, Prof. Dean Ho. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. You are a very accomplished scientist, a biomedical engineer with a lot of clinical experience in a way. Can you please start off by telling us about you, the man, and what makes you tick? So I currently direct uh, the N1 Institute for Health, what we also call N1, as well as the Institute for Digital Medicine, what we also refer to as WISDOM. Uh, these institutes are uh, clinical stage, so we develop all kinds of cool technologies uh, primarily to personalize care for diseases that range from oncology to infectious diseases, um, all the way to metabolic disorders such as diabetes. And what's really important for us is that we view the whole landscape of innovation, from developing the technology, optimizing the technology, all the way to working with healthcare economists, behavioral scientists, to ensure that our technologies make it to patients and ultimately impact society at large. Can you explain to us how you even got to that point? I've always felt that when you merge, certainly engineering with medicine, uh, there's a way to leverage the, the merger of, of that expertise to potentially pr change the way that medicine is practiced. I think it's critical to understand and calibrate how each patient's responding to treatment mm -hmm. and then truly home in on the different drugs, the different dosages that can sustain that optimization for the entire duration of care. Can you tell us what... Um what you consider the traditional way of doing medicine versus precision medicine? Traditional medicine has made critically important strides. Drugs are typically developed by taking these large population studies. The challenge is, let's say we look at cancer. Um, if somebody is randomized and given a very high dose or the max dose and they don't respond, meaning that the cancer gets worse, um, their side effects are bad, um, they're often removed from the study and it's noted that they are a non-responder. However, we will never have known if they could have actually responded to a lower dose. And that's a real pity because time and time again, we've actually seen oncology patients, especially if they're being given multiple drugs at the same time, that not only do they respond at lower dosages, they actually respond really well at lower dosages. And so taking this population approach and applying it to the individual, I think is largely what conventional medicine has been. Instead for us, we champion giving each patient the low dose, the middle dose, and the high dose. And it's totally allowed. We write novel clinical trial designs with our clinical community here. And when patients are able to see more dosages, it's very possible that you'll get more patients responding to treatment properly. Maybe even some patients experiencing optimized treatment as well. So it's truly homing in on the individual, finding dosages that work for them today. Sometimes those dosages change over time and we'll keep homing in on that for the entire duration of care. Clinicians, in a, in a strange way, we do practice personalized medicine, even though we don't call it that. When we have a patient in front, we start with the standard drug that would be and if we have problems, we adjust it with another drug and we optimize the dosage. What's really important to note is that drug synergy is time dependent, dose dependent, and patient specific. So there is a need to probably not fix the dose, but better capture how we can dynamically change these dosages over time for each patient. And it's actually quite scalable. We actually typically need standard of care biomarkers or measurements in order to truly personalize that care. So basically you give a combination that 
perhaps it's not as toxic, then in a couple of days, you reassess the biomarkers to see whether you're getting on fine in terms of the therapeutic response. That's what you're saying, right? That's correct. Um, and we have an example of that. Uh, so we have a patient that was undergoing uh, a two-drug combination for advanced prostate cancer. And when that happened, one of the drugs was actually in phase two trials. So it's a brand new drug, and the other one was approved. And this patient was responding to treatment. But the treatment was so toxic that the patient was going to remove himself from the study. What we did was we were able to obtain a very small amount of data, in fact, the different drugs, the different dosages. And within a few hours, we were able to show that if this patient had one of the drug dosages cut by 50%, their efficacy or efficiency of treatment would actually go up. And we ultimately achieved a durable response for this patient, halted disease progression, and this patient ultimately resumed a completely normal lifestyle. I guess that's where the AI part comes in. Could you explain the actual, like this case, how did you actually do it? What? Curate AI is, is it basically relates drugs and dosages, efficacy and safety, and it basically creates a parabola. It's a U-shaped curve. Mm. And what we need is basically a few data points. Data point, data point, data point. Each one obtained from a different dosage you give the patient of a drug and the corresponding efficacy and safety. Yes. And these parabolas relate the right drug to the right outcome that you want. You will definitively know what drugs to give at which dose at any given time. Now, because we don't need that much data, the costs are wildly different than a lot of these bigger data approaches. Now, I want to put a caveat out there we still do work very closely with the big data teams because maybe we need to know what drugs to even try in the first place, right? So it's a very complementary relationship. But one thing I wanted to note is that at N1, at Wisdom, we don't charge patients for care, right? We actually have a budget set aside where we actually pay for the patient's care because what they are doing is a service to the medical community. It's a service to the patient community, to mankind. So we're potentially reducing complications, we're paying less for the drug, and the patient has less toxicity, and the progression-free survival is longer, and we're covering the cost for the patient. We want to provide this for everybody. And so um, we, what, I, what I would love with this is that we show that we can cut the cost of care, and we let that actually fund the implementation on its own. And so everybody can benefit. So in summary, Prof, what you're really doing is you're bringing a new equation that really works, where you make use of innovation with the AI space into platforms that are actually translatable for the average clinician. And it is a phenomenal mindset change because you're personalizing it, where the patient themselves are the controlled case study, but you can actually look at the unique interactions with existing data, clinical outcomes, and potting that across because of the AI platform so that a patient can really have a personalized outcome with minimal side effects. And that's the beauty of what you're really proposing, the combination of te new technologies, AI with existing data, big data, scientific studies, as well as the clinical experience, in short, for a personalized approach to patient outcome. That is phenomenal. Uh, I think it's all about finding the right drugs mm. for the right patients mm. and dosing those drugs correctly along the entire duration of care. How the clinical side of it interacts with the drug side of it, interacts with the AI side of it. When we think about truly personalized medicine, we had a patient here in Singapore about a year and a half ago, who approached us and told us that uh, he had no further treatment options available to him for an advanced solid cancer. And what we proceeded to do was to speak with the patient's doctor, uh, where we were able to, to trade a lot of questions and answers to better understand Curate AI. And we needed to understand from the doctor, what are the ways we can use to determine if the drugs are working? How do we measure the patient's response? And from that, uh, we determined that we would be using actually the imaging, right? The actual images of this particular cancer to tell us if it's basically shrinking or getting larger. What was remarkable was we found a low dose, a very low dose of a drug um, that 
very quickly resulted in the patient responding to treatment. We actually received an image um, of one of the metastatic growths and it was, there was actually a hole that appeared in it once we started treating this patient. And not only that, not only were we able to achieve this response from the patient, we actually achieved it faster than people thought was possible when given this type of therapy. And if we further look at the outcomes, uh, this patient um, now has a progression-free survival, meaning they're, they're responding well much longer than patients typically do on this particular drug. And even more, we're, we're saving cost of care for the patient, giving a lower dose, potentially less complications, um, and uh, ultimately a better quality of life. And what you did was you used the patient as his own case study. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, you actually funded the patient. Yes. It's amazing. And what's really wonderful is something you mentioned, which is in terms of the stakeholders. There's the regulatory side, the clinical side, the patient side as well. And that's what's been remarkable. It really takes this convergence, this seamless integration of these stakeholders working together and ultimately communicating properly what we're doing with the patient to make this work. And that's what's been exciting about working in this ecosystem. I think Singapore is really a good place because... Um we always want results. It doesn't matter the rest of it, but we want results. We wanted to help patients. And we, uh, I've had the privilege of, of interacting with the regulatory agency here. Um, and it's, a, it's an ongoing discussion, yeah. right? When we think about changing medicine, it's certainly not overnight. Yeah. And uh, it takes a process of learning how to advance from one study to the next yeah how that might influence policy. Yeah. And all of that's only possible when we have this open line of communication yeah. with the regulators. You're changing the way we actually look at healthcare um, outcomes vis-a-vis -vis costs. Could you go a little bit into that? Drugs are expensive to develop because a lot of the process involves error. It involves the quest to find which dose works, you know, are we delivering the drug in the right combination, et cetera. But we have a chance now to remove the uncertainty of that development process. And drugs on the market now, some of them are remarkably expensive, right? And of course, it's not only the cost of development, there's also calculations of giving this drug to what degree does it improve quality of life and add productivity to the patient's ability to, to contribute back to society. But we are in a phase now where we have drugs that cost over a million dollars for the patient. And so using our technology, a novel combination was developed using repositioned or repurposed drugs. These are drugs that are approved for human use. And what was interesting was not only did we develop a novel combo, we actually found that the standard of care that's given ranks much lower in terms of efficacy. And so this combination was proven to work in cells. It was proven to work in animals. And ultimately in humans, it was shown to cut the treatment time nearly in half. Okay, from six months down to three months roughly. Drug companies have spent hundreds of millions of dollars to try to reduce the amount of the treatment time by a week. We're talking about cutting it into, into three months, down from six months. Ultimately, when that was done, we, uh, you know, our, our technology was able to achieve uh, intellectual property protection for this drug combination. But we never intended to profit off of this. After this was done, we effectively gave the rights away for this drug combination because we did this to prove that we could get this done. And during the course of development, it's important to, to, to set certain milestones. People want to know, can you patent these findings? The answer is yes. But in this case, we don't want to patent the findings, right? We don't have to because we want to give the rights away, publish everything, and allow any clinician in the world who sees these results to use this combination with their patients. And we've partnered with a, 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 a giant, a powerhouse industry veteran and, and leader to, to help deploy not only the, the therapies, but the awareness of what we're doing. So what you are suggesting is a completely different way of looking at things where it's a win-win for everybody. We talk about technology. We talk about 
regulatory and the mechanics of developing drugs, but we always have to remember that at the heart of it, it's the patient, yes. right? The patient is the hero going through this, and it's the patient's family. Medicine has long, especially drug development, has long thought that it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money, and when you finally have a result, whatever that result is, it's got to be expensive to recoup those costs. What if you can spend a thousand times less? get an answer that's 10x better. The pervasive thought is, it's not possible, okay? But we've proven yes. that it is possible. We've proven it's not expensive. Yes. And we've proven that the outcomes are achievable yes. with reduced costs. And then we often get questions of, oh, are we here to save the healthcare system money only? My response is, our first and foremost responsibility is to improve the patient's outcomes. And if we can cut the cost of care, this allows the healthcare system to invest yes. in other methods that are advanced as well or help develop newer technologies while still benefiting the patient. We don't have to equate medicine with cashing out our life savings to save our loved ones, right? We can think about doing this economically and ultimately benefiting the patient as much as we can. Thank you very much. You, you really got the patient at the heart mm -hmm. and you're really looking at things in such a different way. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.